This video is about how to do a single arm dumbbell row from a very PRI perspective, a Postural Restoration Institute perspective. For this video to make sense, you want to keep in mind a couple of things. When we are talking about a PEC pattern or a left AIC pattern, the PEC pattern is when both sides of the pelvis are stuck forward. Uh, you can call it an anterior pelvic tilt, but it's not just the pelvis, it's the entire body is existing in that state. It's not a pelvis issue only, but also the rib cage will be flared, elevated on both on one or both sides. And what that does is it creates extension through the lower back. And that's the problem. And then we get a forward head posture. And we've discussed all of this, but I just want to make sure that if you're not familiar with the Postural Restoration Institute or these patterns that we're talking about, I want to make sure that before you start the video, you know what these patterns are. Today we're going to do a single arm row. Um, I'm going to be integrating a lot of PRI principles into that to make it probably a lot more beneficial to the regular gym goer as well as the athlete. Why? Well, so we've talked about this personally before quite a few times. Um, the modern fitness industry is, first of all, it's a baby. It's quite young and a lot of the pr best practices and the way we're taught in training courses is pretty much derived from powerlifting and bodybuilding practices, both of which have really helped propel the industry into the mainstream and actually drive us forward in a lot of ways. But there has been a drawback to that. Powerlifting specific techniques are phenomenal for powerlifting, but they're very, very often just not ideal for general population, and even not ideal for any athlete that actually needs real movement. Powerlifting well, okay, define real, because I talk about real movement as it comes <laughs> okay. to gym exercises quite yeah. often. And sure. I always make the point that gym exercises are gym exercises. They yep. don't necessarily resemble real human movement as we truly exist. See, this is what we really agree on. <laughs> right? So let's say, for example, a bench press or the single arm row we're going to do right now. Um, we can do a movement that keeps us in this bilateral extension position, which is very, very often taught. That's going to be at the rib cage, it's going to be at the pelvis. Okay? That is not what you'll see in most elite athletes. You see it on some athletes, and I'm not saying you can't be great if you don't have this extra variability movement, but when we coach ourselves and train ourselves continuously into these loaded extension, extension positions, it doesn't matter who you are, you're losing the potential to absorb force appropriately, then transfer and redirect that force to another object, whether that object is the ground, whether you're running, jumping, whatever, whether it's someone's face as you throw a punch, whether it's throwing a ball, we need to be able to compress one side of the pelvis and thorax, for example, to throw a baseball, as we expand the other side and then change. This side compresses, this side expands. If we're training ourselves into this bilaterally expanded state, ribcage, pelvis, cranium, everything, then it's going to be very, very hard for us to overcome that expansion and compress very, very quickly when it's a novel task. So essentially what happens is we train ourselves to get really strong in the gym, but probably suck at sports and general life. If you're not an athlete, this still applies to you. If you're walking to and from your mailbox, that's an athletic activity. It's an activity that requires, I'm sure you've heard this phrase before, if you're watching Neil's channel, alternating reciprocal activity, okay? We need to be able to do the full range of motion one way, full range of motion the other way. And the more we train ourselves into one static, rigid, rigid, like just stuck there in that range of motion, you guys have seen them walking around the gyms, right? These are rigid humans. They are not athletic. Again, this is not a slight on powerlifting, it's not a slight on bodybuilding, but if you're not a bodybuilder or a powerlifter, you probably don't need to train like one any more than if you're not a competitive sprinter, you need to train like a competitive sprinter. Right. So yeah. people are going to be doing dumbbell rows, all types of rowing uh, variations because they want usually big lats. Yeah, big lats. But what do you, what do you do with biceps? When I see big lats, I'm always a little bit, uh, I don't think this is a great thing. What, what do you look, when you look at big lats, aesthetically, they look good. Yeah, but of course, wings. what do they mean to you? I know what they mean to me, extension, yeah. for the majority of people. Extension and overconvergence, potentially visually, definitely in the, the thorax. You're going to be driving forward at all times. Or what I tell a lot of my clients who run or athletic, they'll probably move and run like a minotaur. That head is going to be out in front here. They're going to be... And obviously I'm exaggerating, but you just need to go to Central Park on a Saturday afternoon in the summer and you'll see a lot of this. Yeah. It's strong, athletic people doing their best to be fit and healthy. But the technique could just change just a little bit. And also I find for most people who make these changes, the actual ceiling of the strength goes up very, very quickly. A lot of people are worried about that. that yeah, if you take them out of the pattern, am I going to get weaker? 
I would, I'd say acutely, yes. Like, if, if, if you're just judging on gym numbers, yes. If you're judging, okay, if we change your squat pattern, your bench press pattern, you're not going to be able to go hit your max with a new novel movement because it's a new exercise. Mm. But I've seen in everyone who I've done this with, over three to five months, depending on the person and their level of training, their max significantly increases, as does their, their 20, 10 rep max, 15 rep max, and their overall power output. Mm. It increases significantly, and they almost always have significantly less joint issues, pain, tendonitis, and self-reported fatigue from the gym. They, I feel like their CNS is less taxed for these right. movements. Because they go from rigid, strong, but rigid, to more variable. Correct. To a, to a body that can actually adapt to the environment and what they're doing, rather mm -hmm. than rigidity. And when we get these alternating- They're right? stable. That's exactly Stable it. versus rigidity. Yep. They can find stability when necessary and let go of it when necessary. And even with that as well, these alternating movements that allow pressure, viscera, fluids to move front to back, left to right, top to bottom, they actually contribute to the efficient transfer of power as opposed to taking away from it. Like you'll be more athletic and more efficient if you can expand and compress and use this expansion to drive you to the other side and then back again. Mm. It doesn't make you worse. Short term, talking a couple of months potentially. So if I have an athlete who's you know, really at the top of their game, scholarship writing on it, career writing it, maybe I'll wait till their postseason right. for, for, the, for the biggest change. Right. But then they should be able to continue that the whole way through the next season and right. indefinitely after that, in my opinion and experience. Okay, so let's get to the dumbbell single. Right. Arm. Yeah, we're going to do a single row. arm row. Um, we're going to break it down in a bunch of different ways as we go. So I'm going to show you guys one of the many, many variants that you commonly see in the gym of a single arm row. Okay? We'll usually have a bench over here, whatever weight dumbbell we've got here, and you'll see people here, and they'll usually have the arm up here and be rowing. Now, most people will actually rowing. This, you'll see this knee bend, and they'll be doing a lot of quad work. If you're trying to row, why are you using your legs? That's a whole different argument. <laughs> um, but there's usually not a lot of uh, attention paid to what's happening at this hip, what's happening at this leg, this foot, or this. Most people are just focused on, can I feel lat? Can I feel a bicep? Can I feel a posterior deltoid if you know a little bit more? So how do we make that more applicable to the flex, to good forward locomotor movement and good efficiency? Well, let's describe it initially as part of phases of gait. And we're not going to get too much into that because it's a lot. But let's say when we have the femur crossed across midline, again, if you watch Neil's channel, you'll know that if we're in this abducted femur stance, that's stance, that's weight bearing, it's using ground reaction force and gravity to get a sphenoid, or if you, you can't remember what a sphenoid is, your schnoz over a sternum, over a sacrum, over a foot, without effort. They call it, well, I, I, a couple of years ago, maybe 10 or 12 years, they started talking about stacking. I hate that term. Okay. <laughs> I hate that term. <laughs> is, are you talking about the same thing as... Yeah, pretty much. That, okay. Yeah. Uh, the only reason I don't like that term is it's, it's gotten watered down and abused like a lot of terms and, and information the industry does. Yeah. Where I see people saying they're stacking. And they really weren't. No, they're not doing because, it. Yeah. You gotta, this, people were still extended. They thought they were stacking. Yeah. Conceptually, they were stacking, but they didn't realize they were still extending. If you see them front, front to back, sure, this is a line here, but then their head is here yeah. or here, and they're actually not one above the other. Right. Because to be one above the other... There's a rotational element to it as well. Right. Okay, so what I'm going to show, I'm going to show this from a couple of different angles as well, but let's start off nice and easy. Let's ignore the whole right side here, the whole bench side for a moment. What you want to do is I want to have my big toe on the floor pushing me this way. That's a propulsive movement. So that would be like a toe off if I'm walking. If I'm walking, this is pushing me. My right foot now is pushing me forward and left mm -hmm. so I can get onto my left hip. Okay. If you're a human being, that's what's supposed to happen as you start to walk. Okay, so that's what we're going to do here. So I'm just going to stand up here, I'm going to push, and I should start to feel my outside glute on this side. Okay, if you can't, uh, well, this is going to be difficult. <laughs> It'll take and some practice. Now, yeah. again, if you've never done any PRI techniques, or let's put it this way, I know a lot of people have done PRI techniques, but not with proper instruction. That's a big difference. Big, there's a very big, big difference. difference yeah. so, so in theory, this is stuff that you can do, but you may not feel it the same way he's going to feel right. or I may feel it, or someone who is living in more of a state of neutrality. It takes a lot it, of practice, even, yeah. even if you have all those variables, to do them all at once while doing an actual motion with significant load. That's a challenge for anybody. It's, it's difficult. So you still can try it and do it, <laughs> but you may not feel the exact thing that you may not feel left glute the way he's described. Correct. 
or it might just take you a while. You might be better at sensing the stuff we talk about on the right side. And if you get half of this right, you're still probably doing a better job than most people. Mm -hmm. And you can work up to perfection later. Better is better. Perfection is off in the distance. That's what we're striving toward, but not for. Right. So we're going to be here, and you're pushing that back. And the nice way to think about the, the vector of that push is I'm trying to push diagonally backwards to the outside. So if this is my left leg, my big toe is pushing backward and left. And that will push me forward and right. Okay. Now, I, a lot of people are saying, why do you want to do that? Because we always want left heel and we don't want to be on the right side. So, because we're using a left leg. That's correct. Here, we're going to be on the right side. Right. So, we're getting right using the left. Okay? So, now we're going to hinge at this hip. Okay? In this position, if we're doing, if you, again, if you've watched Neil's channel, you'll have seen all four variations. This is sort of a half all fours on the right side. I may have. If you haven't seen an all four <laughs> variation, you can find them somewhere anyway. on okay? the internet. So, we're going to get a little specific here. Again, don't worry about this specific detail right now if you're struggling with the whole thing. If you're someone who feels a lot of pressure through a wrist, you want to put pressure through this part of the hand called the pisiform or the palm heel. That'll take a lot of the pressure off the wrist, specifically as we lean forward, which we'll get into. In the ideal world, we'd also have a little bit of, little bit of contact with the base of the pinky, base of the index, and base of the thumb. But for now, just focus on that big palm heel pressure. Should I even ask why you care about that? I know why you do it. <laughs> but why would they care? It's going to help you maintain that shoulder blade in the right position and the rib cage in that right position. And it's going to, again, facilitate... What does that have to do with your lat on the left side? Well, it's going to give us a lot more stability on this side so we can have that motion over here. We need to be able to have both sides of the rib cage do different things if you want to be an athlete. Different but I've opposite. Said a million times two sides doing opposite things. And so if you're doing a left lat with a row, the right side is still being involved and the left side will work better if your brain can acknowledge the fact that the right side is doing something completely different than the left side. But if that happens when you're walking, one side is right. not doing a whole ton while the other side swings and vice versa. It right. is doing something, but we tend not to sense that But much. if you are extended and you have both sides doing almost the exact same thing, That's that a becomes a problem because your brain yeah. can't make sense of it. Now, if you're really lucky, that may never result in any tangible issues for you. There may be some subclinical issues, some small stuff, but if you are really just hit the jackpot genetically or environmentally, you might be okay. But not all of us are that lucky, unfortunately. I was never that lucky. Me either. And <laughs> most of the athletes I work with, also not that case. Yeah. Yeah. And even people who don't find you know, symptoms arise from this still tend to get quite a, a big performance change from this. And you could also say, just give it time. Because <laughs> you don't know. There's no long-term studies on people that were huge in their 20s. And I mean, well, actually, look at some of these bodybuilders in their 50s and 60s, and it's sad to, just to see them yeah. trying to walk around. That's takeaway so, take PD and that sort of stuff. Yeah. From a joint issue? Yeah. Oh. It's bad. Yeah. So we have our big toe pushing back and out. We're going to hinge here. We're going to find that palm heel specifically directly under our shoulder. You're going to tuck this side of the pelvis. Now, tucking half the pelvis is tough for some of you. Don't try and sense the big change in the pelvis. You're not going to, you're not going to sense that. It's a very difficult thing to sense. If you can tuck until you feel this oblique, this side ab here tighten up while you're maintaining this toe, now we've done... So this is going to, so the right side is going to go yeah, back? That's it. The right side is going to get into the nice tuck position as the left side is anterior tilting. So is that the same thing as rounding the back slightly? Or are you, I would or say, are you describing two different things? I would say yes, but I would say with the caveat, we're not dropping our sternum. This is where people screw up in most all four variations, or here. They'll drop the sternum to try and use their rectus abdominis, their six-pack abs, which a lot of strong people are great with. But they're not good at the, the, that tuck, that pelvic movement. Um, which will be more obliques. Yes. If you don't know how to twerk, that's kind of what you need. You need like, it's pelvic movement independent of sternal movement. It's very, very important to get those obliques on. And if they, but if they cannot get, if now if they have a rib cage that has never expanded with air, yeah, it's going to be tough. Gonna be, this is going to be difficult. It's going to be very tough. It's going to be tough. I would say in that case, you may need to regress from here. First of all, if you feel like you want to go forward, it start off with a very big exhale, and you'll feel those obliques start to turn on. Mm -hmm. It may be very difficult for you to keep those ribs down throughout, so you may have to regress to some some breathing work or some. Kind of much more simple PR work. And the only way you're going to really know if you're getting rib cage expansion is there. You can find these tests all over the internet at this point. Mm -hmm. You could check shoulder internal rotation, mm -hmm. shoulder horizontal abduction. If you have that full range of motion, it's a pretty good indication that you've expanded that rib cage with air, and you'll have that ability yes. to, to separate the segments 
Exactly. So that you can tuck without using your entire body to try to do it. Well, in that case, you wouldn't really be doing it, but. Exactly, yep. So I'm going to show you the way we don't want it and the way we do want it. So we still have this big toe pushing back. We're going to tuck in the pelvis. Now what we don't want is this. We don't want the head coming towards the pelvis. We want to be looking a little bit ahead of the hand, very lightly. The tuck in the pelvis, and we're leaning forward now. This is not bearing a ton of weight, by the way. The weight is going to be on this side. And I'm going to show, just turn around and show you guys the position here. I'm actually adducted in this femur. So that femur is across midline. Now, I didn't go like this and pull the femur across. I move my hip across in the same way we would mid stance, early stance, as we're standing and walking. My whole body will move across that to get that vertical stack that we just talked about, that efficiency. And again, if you're doing any sort of sport involving significant movement, this is important for efficiency. Now, I know this is tough, we haven't even got to the row yet. Okay? <laughs> I guarantee you, for most of you guys, you might have to start off 20, 30, 40 pounds lighter initially if you're a strong person but your ceiling will go up significantly. Right. So when we're here, we've got the big toe pushing back, we've got the toe pelvis, we're leaning forward, we're pushing through the palm heel. Great. Now we're gonna grab the dumbbell. We're just gonna get down and get there nice and comfortably. We're gonna let a full hang. Now just staying here, you'll find, you can see that I'm kind of shaking a little bit. This is a lot of exertion. I now want you to slightly lean forward, again, more towards those all fours positions, mm -hmm. to really emphasize these obliques. Now as we do that, in this position, don't let yourself collapse down onto the shoulder. You're pushing yourself backwards through space. So would you say you have a serratus involved? Oh, 100%. The no serratus, is, serratus is working. Yeah, it's doing a lot of work. So those muscles are keeping the rib cage towards the ceiling mm -hmm. rather than collapsing down. And they're pulling that shoulder blade flush to the rib cage. Yeah, so you're making well. good congruent contact between the shoulder blade and the rib cage, which is no longer occurring in a PEC pattern or a right PEC pattern. Yeah. This is a, a beautiful position for, it's also very much analogous to standing with the pelvis and bearing weight on that side as well. But the one thing you want to be very aware of, which again is often not taught in fitness, is we don't want to be winging that scap, pulling shoulder blades down or in and back. That's going to be a problem here. You'll also probably experience significant discomfort in the shoulder if you do that. Unless you're putting all the weight here and squatting it up like a lot of people do. Right. Okay, so we're going to do the technique. All right, there you go. Okay. All right, here we go. So our big toe is pushing back, our pelvis is tucked, our weight's on the palm, we're leaning slightly forward. We're going to pull back in a straight line. We're not going to pull back until the actual, uh, until the humerus has to lift up and the collarbone rolls. We're going to pull back as far as we can into the humerus, the upper arm can no longer move. That's the end of the range of motion. We're not trying to get a compensatory motion here. Okay. As we do that, we're going to lose a lot of the lat. We're going to start loading a lot of the rotator cuff muscles and a lot of the soft tissue in here. You're going to start to have some discomfort or pain potentially, mm -hmm. or at the very least, not going to be very efficient movement. Mm -hmm. So again, big toe pushes back, took pelvis, weight in the palm heel, like so. Okay. Are you breathing? Um, for this one, for most people, I would tell them, breathe as normally and regularly as they can while maintaining that took position. Now. That's a tall order. If I had someone with specific issues, I might cue them to breathe, uh, inhale back, exhale down. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't focus on that for most of you for a long, long time, because it's a challenging exercise. Mm -hmm. Now this, the way you're doing it right now, is kind of putting you on the right stance. On oh, yeah. the right stance, which is yeah. the, so if someone is in pain, would you do this? I would probably swap it, swap it the entire way around and have most people do it on their left side of the bench. And then what would you do for the other side then? Am I with the right thing? Okay. It depends. If the tests all change from doing this lightly, yeah. do we need to go further? No. Yeah. If, if I have an asymmetric issue, yeah. why, why, why would I treat with a symmetric problem? Right. A symmetric solution rather? Yeah. So you always have to, in my mind, you have to distinguish between people who are in pain and people who are just interested because they understand what PRI is trying to do and they want to incorporate PRI activity or they've gone through a PRI program and they're feeling a lot better. Correct. But if someone's in pain, Things First are of all, very to, yeah, but, yeah. If, this if is you're, probably yeah, not something you if do. you're if you're watching a channel or anything, any channel that talks about PRI and you're in pain, I wouldn't go to this. I'd try to be no, absolutely. Not. I'd be working with someone to get myself out of pain and then starting to use these principles as you get back into strength training. That's exactly it. You need to kind of hit the nail on the head there. These are not things that I'm going to use with a client in pain when they're post pain, when they're recovered, when they're testing table neutral all the time. 
and they feel good and they want to get back to athletic activity, I want them to get there while retaining all of that. 